Now this mystery of that a part of us knows the things that we're supposed to do in this incarnation, knows the greater part of ourselves that we've partially forgotten, because we don't always get a fully empowered upbringing to make us understand the unlimited power and potential we really have, in many cases as we grow up. It can be very constricting. And so there's a part of us that always has within our real forces a slumbering remembrance. In the beginning was the memory. Who am I and why am I here? So this is a critical beginning for spiritual work. And this is something that it's not a question of somebody else telling you what it is. Somebody else could just be laying their trip on you if they say, well, you are so and so and you should be doing this. It has to come internally. It has to be something we directly recognize. This is why so many traditions have the concept of the vision quest. The vision quest is where we go through a particular process to spiritually see what it is we're supposed to do next in life. We get our vision of spiritual purpose. So understanding this as a background, there's another very important component to bring into it. And that is just as we interact with all types of spiritual beings in a more conscious way than we do now, before incarnation, as we pass through the planetary spheres, we made certain obligations, commitments, pledges, what the Japanese call giri, giri, the uh, obligations of life that we are committed to carry out no matter what. And then of course we incarnate, we get very densified, we get traumatized, we constrict, we get all types of reflections that tell us that we're nothing but a physical being and nothing of our greater significance is actually true. And so a whole process of unfoldment has to come forward then. But just as we interacted with spiritual beings before incarnation, so we interact with spiritual beings all the time during our physical incarnation. The thing is that we are put into the physical body for a particular reason. The physical body allows us to become conscious, particularly of ourselves, in a way that it's much harder to do in higher spiritual worlds. So when we are in spiritual worlds without the focusing device of a physical body, we are spread out in these greater non-physical worlds, and we can have interaction with other beings at a much more powerful level than most people experience during their physical lifetime. For many people, an act of love making with a person they are deeply connected with is one of the most ecstatic and transcendent experiences of physical life. But in the spiritual world, it goes far beyond anything we can experience simply by the coupling of two physical bodies. Two people out of incarnation can actually have the energy and spiritual bodies completely intermesh. The rules of the physical body don't work in the higher worlds. So two can become one. You will sometimes perceive in higher worlds a spiritual being that appears to be one great radiant being. That's why in the Sanskrit they refer to these beings as the devas, the shining ones. A great radiant being, but then it starts to split out into multiple beings. And we realize that the being that we perceive was a composite of multiple beings together that can split out or can combinesce together. And so that ability to connect with things beyond our boundaries in the higher worlds gives us certain capacities in higher existence, but also has a particular challenge that it can lead to us being very non-crystallized as an independent individual being. And the process of physical incarnation allows us to begin to crystallize the independent, individual, spiritual self into one particular, completely unique being in the universe. All snowflakes are crystallized water. All human beings are crystallized spirit. But every snowflake has a completely unique geometry. Just like every human being has a completely unique geometry and nature of their spiritual essence. So we're here for a particular purpose of unfolding this. And as we go through this process of physical incarnation, we become more egotistical, we become more egocentric. We feel ourselves versus other things. Even as a small child in a brightly colored kindergarten, you can feel the difference between me here and this outer thing as a physical object. Same thing with other people. In higher worlds, those types of physical boundaries don't exist the same way. So here in the physical plane, it allows us to crystallize ourselves as a separate, independent being. That's why in some mysteries, like in the Christian esoteric mysteries, there's a great emphasis on things like the seven I am sayings of the Gospel of John. 
because the I am sinnings have to do with the I am self-awareness. That's really the core of the Christ mystery in the esoteric Christian tradition. A crystallization of the sense of the self. And so with that particular process, we get cut off from other beings, but it is a type of movement from the higher world where we began the whole process many eons ago as a being that did not have clear separate awareness. That's why when we incarnated thousands of years ago, we had an awareness that was a type of group consciousness. We identified with a tribe. We identified with an external group. As we went through time, people become more and more egocentric, become more and more materialized. In ancient times, the subtle bodies were far outside the physical body, particularly the etheric life body. And that gave us certain types of spiritual powers we don't have today. It gave us certain types of innate clairvoyance that most people don't have today. As we contracted the etheric body back into the physical, it then allowed us to use the vehicle of the physical body and the brain as something that made us more self-conscious, more self-aware. And so it's been a type of descent process into the earthly to crystallize the I am self-awareness. That will then move back out as a mirror reflection of the original descent over a process of multiple incarnations through the process of initiation, and this is true for all major traditions, to then move back up the cycle to where we then become, once again, a fully conscious spiritual being, but at a higher octave than we had before because we will be fully self-aware at that point. Our self-awareness crystallizes from what we might call the pre-personal state into a purely personal state. That I think that I'm Robert Gilbert and I live in Asheville, North Carolina, etc. That's what a great Christian hermetic master like Daskalos on the island of Cyprus would refer to as the present personality. But beyond that is the permanent personality, who one has been in previous lifetimes, the way that we described in the talk on Saturday about how Daskalos could remember all previous incarnations and could even remember all the languages he spoke. He could read and write ancient Sanskrit, Egyptian, you know, Aramaic of the time of Christ, these kinds of things. So becoming a fully conscious spiritual being as we pass through the personal stage will then lead to a transpersonal stage. And that's where we get to what in the Christian tradition might be referred to as not I, but Christ in me. At an even further stage beyond not I, but Christ in me, because the Christ is a macrocosmic being. We're a microcosmic being. The Christ understood in the esoteric tradition of Christianity is the solar logos, the being of the sun, a spiritual being that has the nature of the sun. And so whether one is a Christian or not, the concept of a macrocosmic being and the nature of the spiritual reality of the spiritual essence of the sun is true regardless of one's religious affiliation and background. And then as we move beyond that, we have what in the Christmas prayer tradition might be called I and the Father are one, which is in a union with the greater divine essence. In the Rosicrucian tradition, this is linked to a process of developing spiritual awareness. So in the Rosicrucian tradition, there are three steps in ascending clairvoyance. They're not always in this particular order, but the basic idea is that first, we develop the capacity to perceive non-physical, spiritual realities in terms of images perceived in the mind. And this is referred to in Steiner's work in Rosicrucianism as the idea of imagination. But this is imagination that's not fantasy in the way we think of something I just made up. The imagination is taking a truly existing spiritual reality and clothing it in a spiritual image, something that corresponds to it. And different people in different cultures might clothe it slightly differently. What appears as a blue lady floating on a cloud, to someone from the Eastern tradition, might appear as a human-looking man wearing armor and having wings in the Western tradition. So angelic-type beings are perceived slightly differently. That's the way that we clothe them. They actually exist but will project onto them particular qualities of color and appearance in the process of imagination so that we can get an image of it. The level that we do this is what's known classically as the astral level. The term astral comes from aster, meaning star. It has to do with the spiritual aspect of these higher worlds. And so the first step then is that we get what most people think of as clairvoyance, the capacity to perceive truly existing non-physical realities in terms of images seen in the mind. 
The next stage is a capacity that's a type of spiritual analog of hearing. As the first stage was a spiritual analog of seeing, to see spiritually, connected to certain subtle organs in the human body being developed. So the next stage is the capacity for spiritual hearing. And this is what's known as the capacity of inspiration in the Rosicrucian tradition. And all of these have a capital I, capital I imagination, capital I inspiration. And with that, we get the capacity to perceive non-physical realities through tones that we pick up. Now, if you watch a movie or a TV show, the exact same thing could be happening between a comedy and a tragedy. The difference between the two is the soundtrack. For one, somebody can sit over the head of the frying pan, and it's like, womp, 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 and it's a comedy. And another one, you can have a frying pan, and it's like, da, 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 and it's a thriller or a horror movie or a tragedy of some kind. And the tone, the sound, communicates what's going on. So as we encounter spiritual beings in the higher worlds, we can have a sense of the tone coming from the being. Different beings will send out different tones. So if people have a background in music or an appreciation for sound in general, it's easier to develop this capacity for inspiration, to perceive non-physical realities in terms of sound. And it's also something that comes in with being able to appreciate the quality of people's voices, that a person's voice is a type of spiritual print of them. And you can find out a lot about a person by the quality of their voice. So another way that the soul manifests itself. And then the third stage in these three steps in the Rosicrucian tradition is referred to as intuition with a capital I. This has a specific meaning in the Rosicrucian tradition, which is that the intuition with a capital I is the capacity to perceive non-physical realities by direct union with them, not being separate from them. Now this is known in every major tradition. It's what is known in the Indian Vedic tradition as that art thou. That art thou means that when you at that stage perceive something, you are it. You're not separate from it. You're a part of it. And the two are not separate. Like we talked about the higher worlds, two different beings can combinesce. They can move into a unified state in a way that we can't do with physical bodies in the physical world. And so at the level of this true intuition, we know these higher realities because we're not separate from them. We're a part of them. So this is a series of stages of getting closer and closer to something. And so this is related to a initiation saying in the Rosicrucian tradition, which is that first one sees the beloved approach from afar, and then one hears the beloved call to one, and that finally we embrace the beloved and we become one. Within those types of sayings, there's a tremendous amount of spiritual information. Seeing the beloved from afar, that is the imagination, clairvoyance. The next stage, hearing the voice of the beloved call to us, that is the clairaudience stage, to perceive spiritual realities in terms of tones, the harmony of the spheres. And then, to embrace the beloved and become one, that's that stage of intuition. So, understanding it from this perspective, there's various levels that we can move through. Now, every one of us in this room already has some levels of spiritual perception. Your ability to think, to form a concept, is already a form of spiritual perception. That was a major part of the work of Rudolf Steiner and the Rosicrucians in the last century. Your ability to form a concept means that you can think of something that's archetypal, a unifying, non-physical aspect of something in the physical world. If I say to you the concept circle, then you can think of an archetype of a circle without thinking of one specific circle of a given color or size. That's already a type of clairvoyance. It's perceiving what Plato referred to as a world of ideas. Now often people, particularly in the Western world today, think of this as something very dry and abstract. It's very intellectual. But actually it's something very important to understand that our ability to think what we sometimes think of as an intellectual way is a transition stage to a new form of clairvoyance. 